so Nivea, nice to see you. Thanks, Thanks for and we're very happy to welcome you here. Um, I'm delighted that you've written us this terrific piece, imaginative and, and very beautiful. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the, the brief you were given and about um, how it might fit into the programme? Yes. Um, so the brief uh, that I discussed with um, the uh, uh, members of um, Dunedin Consort was um, to produce a work that uh, somehow dealt in themes of isolation, community and kindness. Um, so I went away and I had to think about uh, those three things, um, not necessarily intending to address all of them, but perhaps one or two um, in a combination that seemed um, right to me. Um, and I think a tricky thing to navigate, certainly in the last year, has just been um, how art engages with these times. And um, it was a little bit tricky with this brief to work out how to produce a work that would not um, force people to um, think about the world in a particular way, um, but rather to offer them something that they could connect to um, in spite of the very many different experiences that I think a lot of people have had during this time. Um, so I thought about the idea from that angle, trying to create something that would be an open enough text that uh, would allow as many people as possible to sort of engage with the idea. Um, and can you tell us a little bit about how you chose the text? Did you go through a lot of, cho a lot of options first, or was it something that immediately called to you? Yes. Um, so two areas suggested themselves to me. Um, the first was to do with music, and the second was to do with the text. And then I thought about those two things, um, how the combination of those two things would work. So the musical element was um, the Lutheran chorale. And that was one of the first musical genres that came to mind when I was discussing this brief um, for Dunedin because of the long history that Lutheran chorales have of serving their communities and being performed by community members. So that word community, I think, did spark for me that point of connection, connecting up to this older musical genre that we still that is still very much a living genre, but we still uh, want to perform and we want to keep producing. Um, works that engage with the chorale as a form. So um, I was interested in uh, producing music that would engage with that genre. And then I thought about what sort of text would be compelling within that context. Um, and before I thought of the text, I thought of the cultural figure that I wanted to sort of latch onto. And that person was um, Rainer Maria Rilke who I think is a figure that has been associated um, quite significantly with themes of isolation and also, I think, um, through his attempts to sort of connect to other human beings through his letter writing. Um, letters to a Young Poet is perhaps one of the most, most loved um, collections that, um, that Rilke um, fans and, and readers still uh, engage with. So, I thought he would be an interesting figure to explore, and then I started to look at his poems, and um, I wanted to find something that was not necessarily very well known, that was quite short. Um, and in his second poetry collection, Lara Nopfa, I found the vigil sequence, Vigilian, um, which consists of four uh, vigil poems, and the first of these was the one that I chose. Um, and then another interesting idea crept in, um, and I think it also was sparked by the, the discussions that we had um, about how text could be used um, in relation to these themes. Um, the idea of having the English translation running alongside the German, so, um, so that the work would effectively translate itself as it went along. Um, and I wanted to do this because the German text is very evocative. The first vigil poem um, is about a sort of dusk becoming night, and uh, it's about capturing this atmosphere of a very charged and wakeful and expectant um, nighttime environment. So yeah, there's something in the poem about, that seems to me about how it's night is a, is a living character. And there's, yes. a kind of, there's a kind of risk or a, or a danger in that which I find really compelling yes, and, and the, yes. I think the music has reflects that in, in a very in a really specific way which I really like and it's extraordinary because it's a very short poem um, and it's really just the poet is just observing night unfolding and um, um, sort of overtaking day mm. and um, 
but he, uh, Rilke, ends with this extraordinary image of the moon being held in the hand of night, which um, I think is uh, a really sort of, it's very physical and very evocative yeah, it's beautiful, isn't um, it? thing. And so I, I did very much want to, I did want people to understand the content of this poem and therefore using the English translation by Jesse Lamont from 1918 um, seemed like a good way of, of having both of those channels running through the piece at the same time. Yeah, I think that's really interesting. What you say about um, Lutheran chorales, you know, historically in, the, in, the, in, in Bach's time, for example, they would be used to kind of, anoint meaning into a piece which I think is a really you know that he'd take a chorale from somewhere else and add it to a piece and it would open up a, a kind of a new room of meaning I think which is a yes. lovely way of doing it and this idea of the of the translation being in the music too it, I suppose that's in a way what some people think music does to the world is that it explains it and makes yes. makes sense of it for in a different in a different light is that something that appeals uh, I think that appeals I think also um uh, together with that, just this awareness of different languages coexisting, so that the idea of different things existing in a piece at the same time was something that I found... Um, well, at first, I hadn't done anything quite like this before, and I think at first I wasn't quite sure um, how it would work, but uh, as I proceeded to write the piece, I found it more and more compelling as a thing to move with, just sort of negotiating those differences, yeah. moving between the two different languages. I think it's really wonderful, actually, the, 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 the different kind of strata of, of meaning and of sound that we have mm. in the piece is really, really terrific. Um, do, can you tell us a little bit about when, once you found the text, or in this case the texts, mm. what happens then? How, what's your process? What does that involve? Well, I think um, what the two texts gave me was a very interesting set of possibilities with regard to form because I knew that there were going to be two vehicles running in this motorway and um, that throws up all sorts of interesting questions about how that's to be managed and um, the unfolding of the, but well, I wouldn't say the narrative of the poem exactly, but the, the observations that are um, happening within the text. Um, so I separated, I think what the two languages gave me was the idea to separate the ensemble into these different groups. Um, so I ended up with a three-part division, so it's three vocal quartets, um, which are all soprano, alto, tenor and bass. Um, two of those vocal quartets um, take charge of the, well, the German and the English texts, respectively. And then the second quartet in the middle, sandwiched in between, um, it's sort of like a, a shadow quartet. They are stealing words um, from both those languages and um, sort of binding everything together musically um, and also towards the end of the piece, uh, operating in a more, uh, providing a sort of textual degree of interest. So, um, yes, yeah, so I think it gave me a way of structuring the material that um, was quite... Um, seemingly quite simple but turned out to be quite complicated in the end because there was lots of interweaving and overlapping between the groups. And to what extent do you, do you consciously you know, work your material like a, like a, a, a craftsman would? And to what extent does the material you know, work through you or, or you know, are you able to, be, to allow the material to work on you in, in that way? I think something that has always interested me, both as a composer and as a performer, um, is just the, this question of what makes music memorable for people. And um, I think one of the most basic ways that I've tried to explore this is through form and also through the idea of rehearing or recycling material so that we, we get to hear something again, therefore it leaves more of an impression, we're able to capture it really. And, um, it's, it lodges itself in the mind. Um, so I think that has always been a concern of mine as a composer, and what I will often try to do is to set the form um, quite rigidly almost. I mean, I think I, I, what I want to do is to know how the piece will begin and how it will end, and I want to be in control of that arc. Um, but then the performer part of me uh, also wants to see space for you know, human beings, for musicians to step in and um, make these pieces their own to sort of add to them with nuances and um, a sort of 
creative reshaping, and I definitely want to see that for my works. So I suppose, uh, in essence, what I'm trying to do is to create forms that will allow the performers to work with the music in that way. So I think it's a, hopefully is a helpful um, balance, a sort of a delicate balancing act um, between me setting these parameters of form quite clearly and then offering that up as the proposition to the performers so that they can do something further with it. Yeah, that's right. I think one of the things we've enjoyed working on it is, is the sense of, of choice that is offered in the piece of, of, of these different levels of sound, different levels mm -hmm. of of meaning and how each thing uh, contributes to the structure. I wondered how it was for you to come in and hear it, having, because you, and you more than me, but I've heard it over the last few months on a sort of ocarina yes. stop, which isn't, <laughs> yeah. which isn't the best way really to hear much music. Um, but I wondered how it was for you to come in and hear it and whether there's a kind of, whether there's a sense of loss when you hear your own music in other people's hands or whether it's all positive. I know Britain used mm. to hate other people particularly singers, other singers, yeah. singing music. He walked out of Peter Grimes once. You know, he, he had a very, very strong reaction. I wondered how that yeah. was for you. Um, I mean, I think it is difficult for composers because sometimes it's the case that you're putting so much of yourself into a piece and then to sort of hand that over um, is, you know, potentially a tricky situation. But I suppose maybe my interest in form is, is the thing that I try and hold on to because... Um, if I'm able to produce something that has a very clear arc to it and a very clear sort of set of formal parameters and a clear vision, then there's only so much that a performer can do to sort of erase that. Um, they can reshape it and they can do things with it that I might not have expected, but ultimately I would hope that the proposition will be strong enough to, to not sort of lose its most compelling elements. and. Um, but then also, at the same time, not completely shutting down what a performer might be able to do with it. Um, so I do find it tricky, but I, I suppose I'm just trying to come up with these strategies that will help both parties along the way. Um, and when you talk about form, can you explain what that means to you? And perhaps, yes, that's perhaps a good in, question. For, for a, a listener who might um, not be a, a compositional yeah, student Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, in the most basic terms, I suppose what I'm talking about is just how a piece unfolds and um, how it begins, where it travels, how it ends, um, and uh, sort of how it sets up the expectations along the way for what might happen and how those uh, expectations might well be challenged or thwarted in some interesting way. Um, or not, as the case may be. It might be a sort of very satisfying realisation of those expectations. I think I tend to make those decisions according to the, the premise of the piece and the, the conceptual framing of it and what I feel it needs to do. Um, so I'm not really dealing in um, historical forms in a very sort of academic or um, detailed way. I, w I sometimes will try and write it in these forms. I mean, for example, I have recently been working on a set of variations for solo piano, and that is a form that has um, this huge history um, of, of being honed, and um, uh, that's something that I'm, I'm trying to learn from it as I go. So um, I'm, not, uh, I'm not sort of completely... Uh, an outsider when it comes to historical forms, but I think I just tend to use them in such a way that I'm actually learning as I as I go through the process. And I think in the case of this piece, there was no um, form that I looked to that was a sort of pre-established approach, um, sort of approach in terms of how to get through a piece of music. Um, I just came up with this. I think the thing that really drove it was the the fact of the two different languages and needing to have. Uh, proposition and then a response from the English translation and then that that pattern was going to be set up. Uh, the, re the, the sort of genesis of this programme came from uh, uh, long before Covid really for me. Mm. I was reading a book, a wonderful book by Olivia Lang called The Lonely City, which, in, which is kind of half autobiographical account of her time in New York, but also she, she sort of excavates various artists for how they dealt with loneliness and solitude, even in someone like New York where you're surrounded all the time by people and evidence and remnants of people. And 
for me it seemed to have a lot of resonance with, with being a singer, that sense that you need complicity from other people, but also that you're often on, on your own, out, you know, in front of people and exposed and, yeah. and all the things that brings. I think composition has a, a different kind of solitude and, and not loneliness necessarily, but a different kind of isolation, let's say. Um, and I wondered what, how that, is that, do you, is that something you'd have to fight against as a composer or is it something you embrace? Um, perhaps a bit of both. Um, I think it can, I think that feeling of isolation can often be the thing that ends up driving a piece. Um, I've certainly produced a few pieces that I think were very um, introverted and um, even in the case of this piece, I suppose the, the fact of the poem being about this individual who's quite isolated, returning to his native city. Uh, Rilke was uh, born in Prague, so um, this uh, poem comes from a collection in, uh, in which he's documenting his return to the city and surroundings that he once knew. So, um, and it, he's alone watching this night unfold. So the poem itself carried that message of a kind of solitude. Um, and I had to somehow um, animate that. Um, so in, in some ways it can help if as a composer you're already sitting alone yeah. um, trying to create a musical response to this. Um, but at the same time uh, I think a huge part of my activities as a composer uh, has been a more sort of hands-on approach of working with performers and um, uh, training as a performer myself, being an active player, musician, um, even uh, more recently trying to assemble and create instruments and um, I think just that the sort of the joy of creating sounds with other people um, is it would be very strange if that were <laughs> cut out of the of the process um, I think it would then become a very lonely one indeed so it, it probably needs both of these things to make it um, charged and compelling yeah, it's that balance, isn't it? And, and yeah. when the balance of, of you know company and, and, and solitude, and when that balance is disrupted, like I suppose it has been for for lots of people in all sorts of ways yes. these last few months. Yeah. That's how we. That's when I suppose tensions, creative and otherwise, um, sort of creep in. Um, any last words on the piece before before we hear it? Um, I, an interesting uh, fact. Um, which actually doesn't have that much to do with the piece in aesthetic terms, but just more to do with me working with Dunedin Consort, was um, the fact that this is the first project that I've actually done in Edinburgh, which is my um, home city. And um, I thought that was quite interesting, actually, because um, I think it's been an interesting um, thing that has emerged uh, during this pandemic, the need to work with artists locally um, rather than sort of everybody being able to tear around all over the, the world um, for their projects. Of course, you know, that is um, a wonderful thing and we very much hope that in the future um, there will be a way of doing that again, you know, as uh, I'm sure lots of people would agree. But um, I, I was also hugely grateful just to be able to do something with musicians and artists that were in my vicinity because, uh, and I think also to work in, in this space as well, um, in Greyfriars Kirk, um, I think there's something special about, you know, working with the people who are local to you, um, even though I'm, I, I don't really, I mean, I'm not sure that that was um, a significant element in our planning for this, <laughs> for this uh, <laughs> project, but it's, it's funny that it worked out in that way and um, that it just happened to be the first time in two years that I've managed to do anything in this city so that for me has been a real um a really special thing yeah um, and i think the positive. group the group really is it has a sort of it's sort of janus faced in, in, in so far as it's really rooted in its place here in Edinburgh, you know, yeah. it's, even the name uh, but also f feels like it looks out very internationally yes. yeah. uh, and i think i can see that that relationship has obviously changed over the last few months but the the piece does that too it has that sense of multiple place, which I think is really, mm. really mm. wonderful. So thank you very much. Thank you.